The following program is a paid presentation. Wake up to the Word. Share an uplifting hour with grace and glory at Baltimore's Faithful. Well, good morning and welcome once again to Baltimore's number one gospel program, Grace and Glory. Reverend Michael's here and we're excited about this morning's opportunity to inspire and encourage you and empower you, but even more so because of our guests joining us today, Pastor Brent Brown yes, sir. of Greater Harvest and Pastor Kevin English of Open Bible. Yes, sir. And they are here to discuss the Minister's Conference uh, of Baltimore and vicinity, correct? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Now, the conference normally meets on uh, once a month or once a well, once a week every Monday every 12, Monday 12 noon 12 noon at New Shiloh Baptist Church one of the best kept secrets in Baltimore Absolutely. but the secret is going to be out today right yes sir all right we'll be back with more information but right now let's make our way to our first spoken word Bishop Dante Hickman over at Southern Baptist Church and then we'll rejoin our guest right here on Grace and Glory Welcome to the television broadcast ministry of Southern Baptist Church. And now a word from our pastor, Dr. Dante L. Hickman, Sr. Praise the Lord, saints and friends. I'm Bishop Dante Hickman, pastor of the Southern Baptist Church in East Baltimore at 1701 North Chester Street, as well as in Harford County, where we have worship every Sunday at the Aberdeen High School. And soon, we hope to be coming uh, to the West Baltimore community to be a blessing uh, in that particular area, not only with worship, but also with community outreach, evangelism, and development. I thank you for tuning in to our ministry broadcast week in and week out. The Lord has been doing some amazing things in the church and in our communities. We're about a great work with community development of affordable housing for seniors and for families. We're doing a health and wellness center to meet the physical and nutritional needs of residents within our community and beyond. We're bringing on early uh, education and Head Start so that we can meet the needs of young people and capture their energy and harness their intellect and their creativity before the streets are able to get them and cause them to do that which is negative and evil. We are bringing uh, food subsidy into the community and trying to attract small grocers uh, that would have healthy food options for residents within our community. The Lord is blessing us to bring recreation and public safety and workforce development opportunities because we believe that all of these things are necessary to restore people and to rebuild properties in Baltimore. We know that the faith-based institution is an important institution towards the vitality and vision for our communities. We want to be a great partner with all of the other institutions to make a difference, to see transformation and revitalization come to our beloved city of Baltimore. I would that you would partner with us, that you would help us. On this past fifth Sunday in the month of July, we had our Together at 10 service. It's a leap of faith service in which all of our locations come together and we worship God in spirit and in truth. And we give sacrificially toward a vision that God would show us. We started this more than 10 years ago and God gave us a vision to go to Harford County uh, with a new location to meet families with our brand of ministry. And we praise God for the effectiveness that we've had for the kingdom of God. God has been using us to do monumental things, and those leap of faith sacrificial offerings have enabled us to move one step closer to fulfilling God's vision for our church. We had a message on this past leap of faith Sunday 
to give sacrificially above our tithes and our offerings. Throughout the month of August, our members and friends have committed to give a $100 seed above their tithes and offerings every Sunday in the month of August. It, it's, it, it's no surprise that the summer months, especially August, is a slow month in the life of the church and in the life of everything. But we're believing God that we're going to sacrifice, break the back of the devil, break the back of a poverty spirit in our faith and our finances. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to sow with us throughout the course of this month. You can write us by mail at 1701 North Chester Street, or you can give through our Givelify app, finding our church and our address. You can text the word give to the number that's on the screen. Or you can go to our website at southernbaptistchurch.org, touch the giving button, and you'll be able to sow sacrificially as well as securely. I pray that you would join us in what I believe God has instructed us to give sacrificially every Sunday in the month of August. I pray that God would give you the resource to be able to sacrifice and to give in what I know God is going to manifest as a miracle in our individual lives, our collective lives, and for the community in which our church is called to serve. God bless you real, real good. God sent me with a word to every person who's been living in the fear and shame of your imperfections, your inabilities, and your insecurities to tell you, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be able to do everything. And you don't have to be secure in all things all the time. In fact, you can have flaws, but still have favor. You can be broken, but still be blessed. You can be insecure, but still be indispensable. Oh, some of y'all looking at me strange like you don't believe it. Can I give you a witness? Moses had an anger problem. Samson had a woman problem. Jeremiah had a self-esteem problem. Rahab had a prostitution problem. And David, he had a lot of problems. But God's grace was greater. And I need 50 folk to jump up and shout, God's grace is greater. I got some mess, I got some flaws, but I thank God he loves me. And I'm preaching this sermon because the enemy of your destiny wants to keep you paralyzed in the trap of your shame and make you think you need other people's approval to live beyond your shortcomings and in your divinely ordained purpose and power. Somebody ought to shout, the devil is a lie. God's grace and mercy are sustainable. And we don't have to live spiritually insecure lives. And Noah's testimony is proof positive that you can and you will recover. Help me preach right quick. Look at your neighbor and tell them you can recover. You can recover from exposure. You can recover from embarrassment. You can recover from inadequacy. You can recover from bad decisions, past failures, drug addictions, alcoholism, low self-esteem, lack of spiritual discipline, scandal, and self-centeredness. Somebody shout, you can recover. And I'm going to let you go when I let you know that you will recover when you discover that your partners are greater than your persecutors. Yeah. 
Look at your neighbor and tell them your partners are greater than your persecutors. Verse 23, but Shem and Japheth, when they heard from Ham, they took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So that while Noah had one son that ridiculed him, he had two sons that restored him. He had one son that laughed at him, but he had two sons that loved him. He had one son that exposed him, but he had two sons that covered him. And I'm trying to help somebody this morning to know that if God be for you, then he's more than the world against you. And always know that if there's one devil fighting against you, that God has many more angels fighting on your behalf. Sometimes we have no idea of who's praying for us, who's pulling for us, and who's looking out for us. I was speaking at a leadership program in Baltimore before a number of corporate executives and social and political leaders from around the state. And someone who was trying to castigate black leadership asked me, how do I maintain a message of hope and optimism to my people in the midst of a city with so much political corruption? I said, first, the perceived corruption does not originate with the African-American leaders that we see castigated on the news. But there are greater powers where the money resides, where the money resides, where the money resides, that perpetuates a system of corruption and oppression. And unfortunately, Everybody is not held to the same level of scrutiny and accountability. I want it to be clear up front that black people who are being publicized, prosecuted, and penalized as corrupt are not the source as much as they are the scapegoat for the system and unseen powers. <laughs> that be of the corruption. Nevertheless, I told them that our grace and hope is in Christ, who has called us to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And despite the trajectory of this world, the people of faith in God will always outnumber outlast and overcome the darkness and somebody here needs to know that you're not in this thing all by yourself for every Moses there's a Joshua for every David there's a Jonathan for every Ruth there's a Naomi for every Elijah there's an Elisha for every Paul there's a Silas and for every Jesus there's a John and if we're going to survive everybody can't be a ham come on somebody ought to help me preach and look at your neighbor and say please don't be a ham because all of us need somebody else to help us to recover and I wish I had 30 people in here that would fist bump your neighbor and tell your neighbor I got you covered if you need me to pray for you I'll pray for you if you need me to buy your lunch I'll buy your lunch if you need me to help you with your bills I'll help you with your bills I will help you to recover you will recover when you discover that your partners are greater <laughs> than your persecutors. We gonna shout in a minute. <laughs> you will recover when you discover 
your power is greater than your perception. Help me preach. Tell your neighbor your power is greater than your perception. Verse 24, I'm a Bible preacher. So Noah awoke from his wine and he knew what his younger son had done to him. And when he woke up, he cursed Ham and he blessed Shem and Japheth despite his flaws and his failures he still woke up and had the power to bless and to curse and whatever you do don't ever make the mistake uh, that my moments of weakness define and delimit who I am. For the Bible says he was drunk last night, but he woke up with the power to bless and to curse. He was naked last night, but he woke up with the power to bless and to curse. He was exposed last night, but he woke up with the power to bless and to curse. He was humiliated last night, but he woke up with the power to bless and to curse. I dare you to look at your neighbor and tell him, don't worry about where I was last night. It's another Sunday morning and I woke up. I woke up with power. I woke up with a praise. I woke up with a shout. Because what the enemy doesn't know <laughs> is that as a child of God, I will wake up from my mess. I'm not going to stay down. I'm not going to stay out. I'm not going to stay confused, oppressed, depressed, and in sin. Like the best of them, I like sin. But I can't stay in sin. I still get convicted when I sin. But I thank God that the Bible says that when we sin, we got a lawyer with the Father, Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation for our sins. And if we confess our sins, stop acting like you ain't got no mess. Stop acting like your stuff don't stink. Stop acting like you dot every I and cross every T. But when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when I wake up, Willa, from my mess, you would want to be on my blessing side and not on my cursing side. Because what I found out was that the exposure of my weakness does not stop the effectiveness of God's word over my life. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us, not my personality, not my articulation, not what I'm wearing, but the power of God. After all I've been through, I'm still anointed from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm the lender and not the borrower. I'm above and not beneath. And I wish I had a hundred folk in here that can shout, I've been through something, but God's hand is still on my life. <laughs> Have I got a witness here? He's still been good to me. He still made ways for me. He still opened doors for me. Somebody shout his hand. Still on my life. 
I'm closing when I tell you. You will recover when you discover your partners are greater than your persecutors. You will recover when you discover your power is greater than your perception. But then finally I'm closing when I tell you you will recover when you discover your purpose is greater than your pride. Oh, we about to shut it down in a minute. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, your purpose is greater than your pride. That's in verse 28 and 29. And Noah lived after the flood. 350 more years so that all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. God, give me 500. 950 years and he died. Look at your neighbor and tell him you're going to live and not die. To declare the glory of God. Now, <laughs> I'm sure that Noah was ashamed, embarrassed, and mortified at how his greatness did not prevent his weakness from being exposed. And I don't care how much of a superman or oh, Wonder Woman, you may be. All of us have some kryptonite. They can take us down, but thank God, it can't ultimately take us out. Look at your neighbor, tell him I've been down, but I thank God I'm not out. Cause a just man or oh, woman, can fall down seven times and still get back up again. Can I be a witness here? Because it was at the age of three years old that my stepfather placed me in a tub of hot scalding water. That experience left my feet and parts of my back severely burned. For a while, as a child, I was disabled and had to use a wheelchair. The doctor told me if I ever walked again, I would not be able to walk very far. But I can report that I ran and walked a half and a full marathon. on burn feet but the hardest part was having to live with my own shame of the burns that wouldn't let me walk barefooted at the pools and at the splash parties in my neighborhood and whenever and wherever I had to take off my socks I had to explain the scars and the story behind the scars. It made me feel like I had to hide myself in order to be accepted as myself. It caused me to feel abnormal, apprehensive, and unable to love myself and not live out loud. But I had to learn that I was not what was done to me. Somebody help me preach. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you are not what was done to you. You're not a slave. You're not a victim. You're not a convict. You're not a statistic. You're not a thought. You're not a loser. You're not a deadbeat dad. 
God has a purpose for your life and you're going to live until it's accomplished because he that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Can I preach like I feel it? The man who burned my feet eventually could not walk and live the balance of his life in a wheelchair. I'm walking, but he lived in a wheelchair and subsequently he died. But I came to tell Wheeler that I don't glory in the vengeance. I glory in the fact that victory was the, what the devil meant for evil. God turned it for my good because his purpose was greater than my pride. Good morning. May the Lord bless all of y'all real, real good. But if y'all want me to shut it down, just holler, shut it down. Dante, shut it down. Shake somebody's hand. Tell them you will recover. Because Jesus recovered. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. But rising, he justified me. Freed me forever. And one day, one day, one day, he's coming back. Glorious day. So live till you recover. Shout till you recover. Walk till you recover. Pray till you recover. Praise till you recover. Walk together, children. Don't you get weary. Pray together, children. Don't you get tired. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Somebody help me preach. No, help me praise. If the devil thought he had you, but you still got away, lift up your hands and shout, be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will, God will, God will take care of you. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Hasn't he done it? Shout it, yeah! Yes! 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 You've been watching the television broadcast of Southern Baptist Church, where Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. is the pastor. If you desire to purchase a copy of this week's broadcast or any of our other media treasures, please call our media ministry at 410-732-8566. Welcome back, and with us today, as we mentioned, Pastor Brent Brown and Pastor Kevin English with us, uh, representing uh, the Minister's Conference of Baltimore vicinity. Uh, there is a strong historical significance with the conference that many people may not know about. Can you guys sh share? Absolutely. Our conference is 115 years old. We are indeed the oldest conference in the country, uh, older even than the uh, Hampton Minister's Conference. Wow. Yes. So how did it come about? Do you know the history? How did it start? I know it started uh, at the Trinity Baptist Church here in Baltimore, um, and the founder's name escapes me now, but uh, it started 115 years ago. It's been meeting consistently uh, every Monday 
uh, from then until now. Well, we have another guest that's a part of this interview that'll be joining us later, and hopefully she'll be able to elaborate on that latter piece. Absolutely. But suffice to say, uh, what was the mission and what is the mission of the conference? The mission of the conference is to continue to pour into preachers of the gospel, ministers, pastors. It's not just exclusive to pastors, okay. but it is inclusive of all ministers of the gospel. And the great thing is that uh, it is not just exclusive to one denomination. Right. Uh, as you know, the Ministers Conference is formerly known as the Baptist Ministers Correct. Conference Correct. of Baltimore and Five How did that name change come about? Well, under the leadership of my predecessor, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, the late Reverend Earl D. Gilead, when he was the president, the Lord let him to bring it to the body and the body agreed to drop the name Baptist yeah. and to open it to the Ministers Conference of Which Baltimore and Vicinity. Which was implied by suggestion that it is for all ministers for of all the gospel, oh, yeah, not gospel. just a particular group. Absolutely. Right? That's awesome. Absolutely. So, you know, for ministers, there are probably a multitude of ministers who are watching uh, who probably don't even know about the conference. Uh, the conference. Can you uh, share with them, elaborate on exactly what the experience is like? Well, we meet again on Mondays at 12 noon, and it's really a time of a fellowship. It's a time of information. Uh, it's a time of inspiration because we end the conference every week with one of our uh, members sharing the gospel yeah. of Jesus Christ. Uh, information is there. We now have a CDC uh, arm of the conference that's helping our churches to really reach out and do some things in their communities. So uh, ministers who connect with us, they're positioning themselves in their ministries to be more impactful. So how does one inquire or get more information about or getting engaged? Just show up or what? Every Monday from beginning at 12 noon at the New Shiloh Baptist Church, uh, we're grateful for our landlord, Dr. Harold Carter Jr., Absolutely. who allows us that space every, every Monday. Week. Come, and when you come, the invitation is given by our president, Bishop Reginald Kennedy, pastor of the Gospel Tabernacle Church, but he is the president of the Ministers Conference of Baltimore and Vicinity. Wow. And he offers that invitation that if you desire to participate and join, you are welcome to do so. And uh, you, you're given the opportunity and space to see one of those persons who will be assigned to speak with you about that. That's great, great. And so it's, it's like a, a watering hole for preachers. It really is. It's a, such a blessing. How long have you been associated with I've that? been associated now since, wow, the early 2000s. I've uh, been blessed to share in um, leadership for the last probably 15 years. Right, as uh, uh, second vice president? I'm currently the first vice president. First vice president. I think I've held every office from first <laughs> vice president down. Okay. <laughs> so it's just been a blessing to share. It's really helped my ministry, bless my life. Yeah. The, the office, holding the office, what does that entitle? I mean, what, what does that entail? Well, we serve the vision of our leader, Bishop Kennedy. Uh, we're there to assist him and carrying out the vision that God has given him for the conference. Uh, he's been leading us now for about a year and a half. He has about a year and a half left to go. Yeah. And so what we do is we serve him and we uh, serve as, as his assistants in a real way to, to uh, bring about the vision, of course, that he's working And of working course, on. he succeeded uh, your predecessor, uh, who was uh, president of the conference at the time, right? Well, actually, um, Bishop Carter succeeded Dr. Gilbert. James? Yep. Oh, I forgot James about him. Carter. Yes, yeah. yes. I, succeeded, I, and now Bishop sorry Kennedy. Sorry about that. And, and now Bishop <laughs> Kennedy is yeah. succeeding uh, Bishop, Bishop Carter. Carter. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So listen, we, uh, I've got another guest that's a part of the affiliation mm -hmm. that's going to be joining us, but we really appreciate you guys coming by to share with us. Any parting words that you want to share about the conference? We, we, we're excited to have you share with us every Monday. We're looking for fellowship, koinonia. We are just excited to share with other brothers and sisters in ministry. All right. Well, speaking of share, we're going to make our way to our second spoken word. Dream Life Worship Center in Randallstown, Maryland is an uplifting church here on Grace and Glory. Part two is situationships. Situation. Situationships. It's a term that really describes a, a, a relationship that lacks clear boundaries or commitment. Mm, I'm in a situation. Mm -hmm. And it's often characterized by a lack of defined expectations. 
so it is a situationship. Individuals, they may go on dates, they may introduce uh, one another as my friend, or just by name, or avoiding a label altogether. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but their relationship is not defined. Uh, situationships can last uh, for weeks, they could last for years. Yeah. Sometimes situationships looks like that, that auntie that you always thought your uncle that they was married. <laughs> Yeah, you didn't know until somebody passed away. They didn't know obituary. They went, come on, somebody. 35-year situationships. But it's important to know that situationships can be ambiguous and they lead to confusion and emotional distress yes, yes, yes. by one or both parties involved. Clear communication and mutual understanding are crucial in navigating a situationship or determining if it's a right arrangement, which is not, it's not. Yeah. It's usually not because what happens is, it's usually one person who is the one who stays in the realm of confusion. The other person knows exactly what they're doing, yeah. mm. okay? And so a situationship is really not God's idea. God's ideas for our life, as the worship leader said today, are yes and amen. They're, they're, his, 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 his idea for our connections are very clear. That's right. There are no gray areas in relationships. There may be grace areas, mm. and those have to be defined as well. But it is God's will for us to know exactly who, what, why, and when we are connected to individuals, and those relationships should serve a purpose. I like to say that dating is uh, learning. Yeah. Dating is learning. Okay, and then courtship, I believe, is pursuing. Okay, that's good. And then marriage is committing, commitment. So some people skip dating and jumped into courtship. Some people stay in dating. And then some people stay in dating. Mm -hmm. okay. Some people stay in dating. And five years later, if we're still five out. years. It's very subjective. So we're not saying that if, if you've been dating somebody a year, that's too long or two. But, but to be very, very transparent and honest, after you have lived past a certain age and had a certain level of experience, it does not take years to know if you are committing to a person in marriage. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we settle for these situationships are varied. Sometimes it's fear of losing that person. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's our own self-image, thinking that if we place a boundary or a demand that we'll end up being alone. You know, sometimes it's settling for less than what we know, what we know we deserve. And so we end up in a situation. But even when the love is not there, you still have, should have commitment. So Say that again. Love and commitment. Because love empowers your commitment yeah. to that person. And commitment can even empower your love. If you hang in there long enough, mm -hmm. many times with the right counsel, right prayer, the love will even begin to grow and begin to come. Mm -hmm. But what we have today is that sometimes we have people who are in a situation that say they're in love, but they're not really willing to be committed mm -hmm. to the very tough times, the times mm -hmm. you want to throw up your hands. And you can't just get that after you get married. You got to make a decision when you, before you get married. I am not just going to be in love with this person, but I'm going to be committed to them. Amen. So sometimes I think a lot of times situations, uh, we have a situation ship because people don't want to be committed. It's true. Absolutely. Yeah, we got, we ran into, you know, players from the Himalayas. That's what oh we used to call them. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. You know, Phyllis Cuttingham wrote a book, How to Be Played by a Player. Mm-hmm. And we're not talking, and it's, it's, I won't say it's a shame. We have to have a conversation like this in the church. It's but good. we do because there's a lot of situationships in the house of God, That's in right. the church. That's right. Wh why are we here? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Relationships are, can be identified in these ways. Like I said before, an undefined connection 
One thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to stay in a space where it continues to be undefined. Mm -hmm. So first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fine. But after we get some month, a few months down the road, we need to know what's really good. What are our intentions? Are our desires shared? Are we on the same page? So a situation begins with an undefined connection. The situation can be an on and off relationship. Mm. Y'all just look, some of us have done uh, on again, off again, on again, off again. Over the years, that is a situation with friends with benefits. Which I don't think, now friends with benefits shouldn't even be named the most. No, but it shouldn't be. That's what, that's what Paul said. That some of these things should not be named among us, yet they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so what are we becoming together? Mm -hmm. Now, there are seasons when I have to support you mm -hmm. in what you're doing. But then, as I, I mean, I, and this is very important for men to hear this. Because there are seasons when our women, they help us. They, they sacrifice because they know this is what you're doing. I'm going after a career. I'm going after the doctorate. I'm going after my law degree. But there comes a time in the life where that woman needs you to support her also. Where she says, oh, what, what is my purpose? I've raised the kids. I've supported you. I got a purpose too. I got a dream too. Mm -hmm. And you have to be sensitive enough to your wife or your, that person to say, you know what? You're right. You've sacrificed for me. We're going to throw everything we can these years and then getting you the way you need to be. That's real relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not a situation ship. Not a situation ship. So what about marriages, honey? Can marriages be a situation ship? Absolutely. I'm going to give you two in particular. Uh, one of them is when there's broken trust. Mm -hmm. I think you shared that a little bit early with me sometime earlier. And then the other one is when um, it's a blended family. Mm -hmm. A blended family can create a situation ship. Yeah. How so? I'll, I'll give an example. Go ahead, please. A blended family can create a situation when the boundaries between the exes are not made clear. Okay. <laughs> what, what, kind because of, what kind of boundaries? I'm getting this, ready to this tell this you. Help some because. Because you, I got two of his kids. I, I gave him two kids. That's fine, but you're not calling me any time of the day or night. You don't have access to me like that any longer. If it's an emergency about the children, absolutely. Otherwise, you don't have access to me like that any longer. And if, if, if I'm going to use me for an example, if I don't create that boundary with the ex, I have to do that. That's right. My spouse should not have to do that for me. So look, bruh, you can't call me. Well, you know, this is... And then also shared events. Sometimes those things can become a slippery slope. Yeah, because you may have grandchildren. Together, you have shared. You have shared events. Yeah. You have things that you that you need to be there for. You know things that have blended your families, even though you're no longer together. So if I attend these shared events, what happens if my spouse doesn't want me to participate any longer? You know, that can become a situation ship. Yep, yep. You know, so then there has to be communication. There's got to be some compromise. There's got to be some decisions made. Now, if a spouse prohibits you from, because of their own insecurities, that's going to create a situation ship. Yeah. yeah. So blended families can definitely be a situation ship. Uh, disciplining, if you have minor children. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you're going to say something strong to a child, okay, their mother or their father may step to you. Hey, don't talk to my baby like that. I know I would have on the other side. Yeah, yeah. I would have that. Thank God I had never needed to. Well, something yeah, a little bit, but I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. You know, those yeah. kind of things can create situationships that with the help of the Holy Spirit, with clear communication, even transparent moment, he and I, we have had family meetings with my ex-husband yep. and, and my children's bonus mother. Absolutely. We have created a Zoom, because I don't want to go sit down nowhere, y'all. I'm just saying, but Zoom. <laughs> 
And we have talked things through Talk regarding, things. The and you know what a mama gonna say, my children. <laughs> Not our children, my children. We have talked things through. We need to. We need to get this. We need to get this straight. We got to set some boundaries. We, we need to get this straight. We need to get an understanding. Those things can, can create situationships in marriage. Broken trust. How can that create a situationship in marriage? Well, you brought that to me uh, a little earlier mm -hmm. of how when a partner, a one has gone out on the other, mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden you expect to have the same kind of privileges or same kind or the the same normal that you had that it ain't gonna happen that ain't gonna happen you you're gonna you're, you're gonna have to go through some changes you're gonna, yes. you're gonna have to rebuild trust so if 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 she wants to know everything that's going on in your on your cell phone for a couple of months you can't be tripping mm -hmm. because it was on the cell phone that she found the evidence yeah or he because, you know, men, men get sensitive. You know, women I, cheat too. So, both ways, either I know, way. I know, but we're but we talking about he now. Okay. All right. Yes, Because I'm right. always dealing with he. Yes, and I'm always dealing with she. So, go ahead on. Are you dealing with that much she? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Jesus. Help her. <laughs> no. But, it, no, it doesn't matter. Either, either yeah. way. Either way. Mm -hmm. When there's a, a healing that needs to take place, when trust needs to be restored, there is a different it's it's a different it's a situation ship. It is. And like I said last week, at that moment in time, the two of you have to decide that you still want this. Uh-huh. Because sometimes you have one that says, I want to keep my marriage together. I know I want to keep my marriage. Okay, but what if the other one doesn't want to keep the marriage together? Uh-huh. And you gotta find out. Is this is such a situation ship we just in? Uh-huh. Or what let's clearly define what's going on here. Not only infidelity, but also financial infidelity. Fi Ooh, explain that. Financial infidelity. Financial infidelity is when you have mishandled monies that have put our family and our living situation at jeopardy. That's right. Now, I'm supposed to trust you with all of the money. I had to tell somebody not too long ago because they had messed up so bad in terms of their, you know, their finances where they were having problems getting established and getting this and getting that. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, you know, you might want to just kind of turn it over to your wife. You can still be the head president and she'll be the accountant. Amen. Doesn't, Amen. Mean, doesn't mean you're not the Stroke president. Stroke that male ego, baby. No, 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 no. And I, and I explained, I explained to them, I explained it to me because I'm not, I'm not trying to kill a brother's power because that's true though cause that's if, good if, though if you give if you can't just give all your money you don't have nothing no mm -hmm. yeah. but it's good because <laughs> no, he, we, we really are to 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 help one another's weaknesses that's what i'm saying I, I'm so it's about, a matter of that you got to put that perspective on it that's good i'm referring to the health of the relationship in the mm -hmm. marriage we're in a situation now mm -hmm. and you keep destroying our money because you're mismanaging our money right that's financial i reality. love you right. you love me but this living situation ain't, ain't cutting it. Mm -mm. And a lot of people in situations like that, they don't know what to do. Right. I love this man, but this man, I, I'm, this man is, is, is killing our future. Yes, yes. And, 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 he, and, he's, and he's causing tension in mm -hmm. this marriage. Mm -hmm. And for women, it's, I don't want to have sex with him no more. Mm -hmm. For sure. Or, or I don't want to have sex with her because because bad finances could be a, a a quick sex killer. Any kind of unresolved issues in a relationship would kill that for a woman. They will, because she's more emotionally mm -hmm. given to it. Yeah. So we, like we well, we we're going back to the money. Mm -hmm. uh, much money. We should say much romance, <laughs> much finance, much romance. Little money, little honey. Honey. <laughs> <laughs> no money, no honey. <laughs> that, that, I mean, that's sometimes the case. Okay, that's not with all y'all, but I, I don't know too many situations where the money is bad and they just keep jumping back and forth in the bed. I don't know a whole lot of situations like that. I don't either. I praise God. I, I, you blessed if you have it like that, okay? But the point is, the point is, is that I have to tell the individual it's okay to surrender the finances to the person who was most qualified because what's most important is our relationship. Yes, absolutely. Is our marriage. Mm -hmm. And this is hurting it. Now, again, 
setting some boundaries. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you don't still know what's going on. Sure. You still the president, the head of your house. I want to know what's going on still. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right? And I'm not going to give you all my money. I'm going to give you, what I mean by that is that you're going to have to give me back some. And, that's, and I also explain, this is maybe just for a period of time. Yes. You know, but you got to do whatever you have to do to save that relationship. Mm-hmm. Many times. Well, I know back in the day, like our grandmothers and they, they you know, Papa Brett bought the check home. Yes. Yes. And they had 12 kids strong. She, he brought the check home, and my mom, she, she, she did what she had to do with it. Yeah, but that day is over with. <laughs> Brothers ain't going out like that. Brother, we ain't going out like that. I know I ain't going out like that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, these kind of situations, they happen in marriages. They do. They do. They do. And so you have to be able to, to, to get the help that you need. So that your marriage does not become a situation ship, doesn't remain a situation ship. You can get to a place where people can get to a place where they are so tired in a relationship that they are just there. Yeah, right. There's no, what you say, you say you could be a, a roommate. You could be a roommate, which means you're just there because it's a good financial situation. You, you both mm -hmm. are able to live too there much because you're, pay, you're paying bills mm -hmm. together, so you're able, but you ain't, there's no romance. Right. Okay, and then or you could have a you could be a prison mate, a cellmate. A cellmate. You're in prison. You in so cellmate, roommate. Cellmate means I can't be who I'm I'm supposed to be. I'm in prison, and some of you know what I'm talking about. If you're in a marriage where you can't be you, that's a clear indication that something wrong. You in the situation shit. Mm -hmm. Because marriage is that person is supposed to love you for who you are. Right. And that doesn't mean that we, you don't have any things to change or work out. But if you never change, mm -hmm. you mind. Lord have mercy. You felt that, didn't you? I felt that. I know you did. I want to just, just tap into about soul ties. Yes, please, please. I want to talk about soul ties just please. really quickly because it's very important that we understand what that term means. It really means that when you are connected to someone... First of all, your soul is not your spirit. Your spirit is not your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your spirit is the part of you, if you're born again, that lives forever, where the Holy Spirit resides. It's your eternal part. But your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. Some psychologists call it your personality, the seat of your personality. Your mind, your will, and emotions can become entangled with another person's mind, will, and emotions That's good. when you are intimately involved with them. That's good. And so you become, it's like this. It's like you all intermingled, interwoven together. And it causes an ungodly soul tie. And so oftentimes we find ourselves in situationships because we're unable to break out of those things on our own. It takes deliverance. Yeah, that's right. That's supernatural. It takes deliverance, the Holy Spirit to deliver you and set you free. It takes accountability. Yes, yes. It even, it even brings into place the role of a midwife in the realm of the Spirit. Hmm. Where someone can come alongside you and pull you out of that in the yes. realm of the spirit. Yes. And so some of you may find yourself in soul times. You hate the situation. Really, in your spirit, you hate the situation. Yes. Okay? When you look at your, yourself in the mirror, you hate that you're in it. And you're asking yourself, how did I get involved with this person? Why can I get, not get free from them? And every time you say, I'm going to get free, I'm not going to go back, it's because there is a soul tie. But I just want to prophesy to you today. Yes. I want to declare and decree over you today that by the power of God, the Holy Spirit is going to be beginning the process of setting you free from every ungodly soul tie. Tie yes. in your life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The strong man has to go. Has to go. Amen. The strong man has, has to, to go. go. Thanks for joining Dream Life Worship Center here on Grace and Glory. Also, you have time to join us online or in person. Visit dreamlifewc.com.
We would love to see you at the dream. Welcome back. Now, before we close out, I mentioned we had another guest joining us, and she's no stranger, Apostle Leah White from Greater uh, Faith Baptist Church. And she's with us along with Kevin to stay with us to talk about something special. First, yes. Apostle, it's good to see you again. As well, it's that good to see you. That smile is still beaming, too. <laughs> Thank you kindly. The gala. There's a gala associated with the Minister's Conference. Tell us about it. We're celebrating our 115th year of existence. It'll be at Martin's West on Friday, October the 27th at 6.30 p.m. The tickets are $125, and they can be secured by calling 410-961-3316 or... Or for calling the Open Bible Church at 410-488-4646. You know, I don't need AI when I've got her. She, <laughs> she, she, she got all of that <laughs> information. Now, you serve as the uh, chairperson of the gala? Yes, and I'm also the treasurer of the conference. Okay. And so we're... Yeah, a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, and, and, it's, and I think this is so uh, significant. We're uh, charging $125 when... Uh, the conference began 115 years ago. Wow. It only cost 10 cents to join Amazing. and 10 cents a year, a, a month rather. So it came to $120.20 for the entire year. So we're only charging $125 for tickets. That's amazing. That is amazing. Now, um, uh, the event, what's going to be the focus during the gala? Well, what we want to do is just celebrate our existence and the fact that we are iron sharpening iron. That's good. Because uh, it, we, and for 115 years, some of the greatest pastors, greatest preachers, greatest pulpiteers, and greatest servants have come out of Baltimore through the Minister's Conference, which was formerly the Baptist Minister's Conference. That's awesome. So, so the date on the event again is? Friday, October 27th at 6.30 p.m. at Martin's West. Now, uh, of course, uh, there's a time of celebration and a time of reflection also from some of the uh, heroes that have come through the conference. Right? Absolutely. And so I'm looking forward to the celebration. And uh, again, if folk want to get more information about the conference, then like, okay, you've just kind of tickled my appetite because I, I didn't know it was there. Right. Uh, if someone wanted to call, maybe if they can't show up right away, mm -hmm. but want to inquire about the conference, uh, is there a contact number? They can always call me at 410-961-3316, or they can call uh, Pastor English at... 410-488-4646. You guys were good as a tandem. Worked together good. <laughs> so for you, what has as it relates to your ministry, what has the conference mean? Well, you? the conference has enhanced me uh, recently, and I think I think I want to reflect on that more than anything else. Recently, we did a whole month on mental health, where we did workshops and uh, uh, we had speakers come, and we had preaching that aligned itself with the mental health of clergy, because if we're not whole, we can't help make others whole. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And we need to deal with, especially after COVID, so much has happened. And so we needed to deal with that and really come to face to face with the fact that all of us need to focus on keeping ourselves well. That's good. Well, listen, we appreciate you both, and we're excited about the upcoming gala, but even more so, you've piqued the interest of others about the conference. We applaud and celebrate you. Thank you for coming you by so and much. sharing with thank us. Thank you for having and us. And we thank you for being with us. Hopefully, we've accomplished our objective today to get your Sunday morning started. If, in fact, we've accomplished that, then our labor has not been in vain. Until next time, remember to continue to walk in His grace and live in His glory, and we look forward to connecting with you right here next week on Grace and Glory.